This is definitely one of the biggest parts of landscape photography that you don't always hear about. There's a lot of driving. And sometimes it feels like you have all the time in the world on your hands when you're driving to the location, but once you actually get there, everything always seems to move a little bit too fast. I can't count the number of times that I've set up my camera and taken a photo right before the light faded away, maybe just with a few seconds to spare. So that's kind of where I'm coming from when I'm talking in this video about the best camera settings for landscape photography. As a landscape photographer, you not only need to know how to set your camera as accurately as possible, but you also have to have it kind of ingrained in your mind so that you can set it quickly in those situations where the light is fading away. So in this video, I'm going to tell you my recommended camera settings as a landscape photographer and the step-by-step -step process that I recommend so that you can set them correctly as fast as possible every single time. So step one is just your basic camera setup. And I know that this whole video is about camera setup, but right now I'm just talking about the things that you set one time and you never need to set again. The first one is just to shoot RAW rather than JPEG. If you've watched this channel, you probably already know that I was gonna say that, but RAW files are much higher in quality than JPEG. And RAW files do take up a little bit more file space, but as you can see, when you're editing a RAW file versus a JPEG, you just get a lot more image quality and way fewer compression artifacts. So I'll usually set a 14-bit RAW and then lossless compression. Lossless meaning that it doesn't actually affect your image quality. So that's it for raw. Next up, white balance. And this is actually one of those things that once you've set raw, you don't even really need to worry about your white balance uh, because it's very easy to edit the white balance in post-processing on a raw file. You don't really lose any image quality when you do that. And there's a lot of settings like that. There's also your vignetting, sharpness, all of those things you don't need to worry about once you shoot raw because they don't impact raw photos. So if anyone tells you that shooting raw is complicated, that's really not true. It actually saves you some time in the field because you don't have to worry about these things. Now the only other setup things to worry about are, I recommend to add the histogram and the blinkies option when you're reviewing your photos. They look like this, and essentially they just tell you when anything in your photo is overexposed. Overexposure is the one thing that you really need to avoid as a landscape photographer, because you cannot recover overexposed highlights in post-processing. But that's basically it in terms of camera setup that I would always do no matter what camera I'm shooting with. I just make sure that I've got those high quality raw photos and that I have the histogram or the blinkies popping up after I've taken my picture. Now, the next most important step after you've set up your camera like that is to use a tripod and make it as stable as possible. Now, right now I'm using my tripod to film this video, but I always carry a tripod with me when I'm out taking pictures, even in the brightest of conditions, because I find it incredibly helpful for landscape photography. And this is true not just because it makes your photos more sharp, although it definitely does, but it also gives you a stable platform to base your composition. This way you can make minor edits to your composition and really hone in on that perfect perfect framing that works the best for the landscape that you're photographing. Now, in terms of making your tripod as stable as possible, there are a few tips that I recommend. Uh, number one is just to make sure that everything is locked down completely. Pretty often I see photographers who have maybe the panoramic base on their ball head unlocked, and that means that when you take the photo, the camera might actually be moving just a little bit. You might not notice it at first, but when you get back to your computer, you might see a little bit of low-level blur in those photos. Now on top of that, it's always useful to keep your tripod as low to the ground as you possibly can, especially in really windy conditions. And if you do have to extend some of the leg sections, make sure that you extend the thicker leg sections first. So always start with the leg sections at the top and then work your way down to the bottom. And in terms of your center column, uh, either get rid of it completely or just only use it in completely calm conditions with no wind, because that thing is basically like slapping a monopod on top of your tripod. It can cause a lot of blur in your photos. Now in extremely windy conditions, you might have actually heard some photographers recommend to hang your backpack from the little hook that's underneath most tripod bases. And this could work in some cases, but usually if the wind is so strong, it'll actually cause your backpack to swing and that can make your photos more blurry than they were before. So if this is the case for you and you're shooting in these super windy conditions, I actually recommend keeping your backpack on the ground and then attaching either a rope or a bungee cord between the tripod hook and your backpack and then making your whole setup more stable like that. It actually works really well. I've used this in wind conditions that practically knocked me over. So if you do have your backpack with you, throw in a bungee cord and you might find that it's pretty helpful for keeping your tripod as stable as possible. 
Now, it doesn't really make sense to talk about broadly the best camera settings for landscape photography unless you talk about which situation you're shooting. Because if you're taking pictures on a bright sunny day, that would be completely different than photographing something like the Milky Way. And broadly speaking, there are four different situations in landscape photography, and each one calls for slightly different camera settings. The first situation is it's daylight and nothing in your photo is moving. Second situation is it's daylight, but there is something in your photo that's moving. Third situation is it's nighttime or it's getting very dark and nothing in the photo is moving. And then the final situation is when it's nighttime, but there is some movement in your photo. So that's why I'm going to go through each situation one by one, starting with by far the easiest, it's a bright sunny day and nothing in your photo is moving. Now in this situation and all the others, the big camera settings that you need to worry about are exactly the same as always. You've got aperture, shutter speed, and ISO. And you can kind of imagine that if nothing in your photo is moving, shutter speed doesn't really matter that much. Now of course it does still affect how much light you capture and how bright the photo is, but it doesn't have any impact on the movement in your photo because there is no movement in your photo. And something similar goes for ISO. You're not shooting in low light conditions, you can just keep your ISO at the base value and then get the best possible image quality. And then it basically just comes down to aperture. And aperture does have a lot of different effects in photography, but the most important one is depth of field. Now aperture affects how much of your photo is in focus from the front to the back. And in landscape photography, there are going to be a lot of situations where you do have a close foreground and then something in the distance on the horizon. In order to get both of those to be sharp simultaneously, you're going to want to use an aperture that's kind of narrow, something like f8, f11, or f16. Start with f8, if it's not giving you enough depth of field, jump up to f11, and then jump up to f16 for those really close foregrounds. Now just a side note, those are the values for a full frame camera. If you have a crop sensor, divide those numbers by your crop factor. So basically just figure out whatever values on your camera are the equivalent, set those and you'll end up with plenty of depth of field in your landscape photos. Now for daytime landscape photography, you can pretty easily use aperture priority mode if nothing in your photo is moving, because again, you basically don't care what your shutter speed is. You've already fixed your ISO, you can set your aperture and then just let your shutter speed float. Now the next type of photography is when you're also taking pictures in the daytime, but this time there's something in your photo that's moving. It could be as simple as a waterfall or even just grass blowing in the breeze, but when you do have something moving, suddenly shutter speed becomes a lot more relevant again. So in this case, the optimal aperture probably hasn't changed very much. You're probably still using an aperture like f8 or f11, but now you have to make sure that your shutter speed gives you the amount of motion that you want in the photo. Sometimes this might be no motion at all. Maybe you're taking pictures in a forest and the leaves are blowing a little bit in the breeze. In cases like that, you might want them to be completely frozen and you'll have to use a shutter speed that's relatively fast, maybe one one hundredth or one two hundredth of a second. You'll also find yourself having to bump up the ISO because suddenly your aperture plus shutter speed combination isn't capturing enough light. And that's perfectly fine. A lot of landscape photographers try to avoid using higher ISOs, but if you need to, it definitely beats having some blur that's unwanted in your photo. In other situations though, you might actually want to have that blur. Maybe you've got a waterfall or a river and you kind of like the movement of the water as it's captured with a long shutter speed. Just throw a neutral density filter onto your lens, you'll cut down the amount of light that reaches your camera sensor and you'll be able to use those longer exposures without overexposing the image. In any case, if you do these things, you will be able to have a lot of control over what shutter speed you use and therefore how much motion appears in your photo. And a lot of times you won't really care about that motion one way or another, at which point you can just use the exact same camera settings as before in those situations where there's nothing in your photo that's moving. Now the next part, which also isn't really that tricky, is when you're doing nighttime photos and still nothing in your photo is moving. You might be surprised to hear that I took this photo with a two minute long shutter speed because it doesn't really look like it. This just seems like a typical photo of a sand dune. But in fact, it was after sunset when I took that photo, there was very little light to work with, so I had to use a really long exposure in order to gather every last photon that I could. But at the same time, there's no issue in this photo with motion blur or anything like that because nothing in the picture was moving. Pretty much all that I had to worry about was not bumping my tripod while I stood next to it for two minutes. But there are two different changes that I would recommend for this type of photography compared to daytime landscape photography. Again, both cases if nothing in your photo is moving. 
for nighttime landscape photography, even when nothing's moving, you can't get away with aperture priority mode because in low light, your camera's meter is just gonna go haywire. It might recommend completely wrong exposures and especially we'll have a lot of difficulty using exposures longer than 30 seconds. So if it's really dark, I definitely recommend setting manual mode and not relying on your camera's meter in order to set the exposure. The other change that I recommend is to turn on your camera's long exposure noise reduction setting in the menu. And this can actually be kind of an annoying setting because it actually doubles the amount of time that every photo takes when you're using long exposures. So instead of waiting around for two minutes, you'd have to wait around for four minutes. No one likes that, but the benefit is that long exposure noise reduction improves the image quality of your shots. If you don't have long exposure noise reduction turned on, you can end up with these little hot pixels and speckles in your photo, but if you do turn it on, that problem's eliminated, and even though you have to wait around a little bit longer, it saves you a lot of time compared to trying to get rid of those hot pixels in post-production. Now the final situation to deal with in landscape photography is also the most difficult. And this is when you are still taking pictures at night, but something in your photo is moving. And this could be anything from the Milky Way galaxy moving across the night sky to some cars on a distant road whose lights move through your composition. And when you combine that movement with the really long exposures that you're usually going to need to use at night, it's pretty common that those subjects are going to turn out blurred. And sometimes that's a good thing. You've probably seen some really interesting photos of star trails at night, or maybe some cars with long exposures moving in the distance, and these can turn out really well. But other times, especially with Milky Way photography, you might want to freeze that movement, and that can be really tricky. I've actually had to devote a full, roughly 35 minute video course to photographing the Milky Way to get really sharp stars, and as you can imagine, I can't quite go into that much detail in this video. But the basic recommendation that I have is to start with shutter speed. Don't worry about aperture and ISO yet. Use a shutter speed that guarantees that you're capturing as much light as possible without causing your subject to turn too blurry. For Milky Way photography, that's usually about 10 to 20 seconds, just depending on which direction you're pointing your camera and how wide of a lens you're using. And 10 to 20 seconds might sound like a pretty long exposure, but if you're taking pictures at night, it's not going to capture very much light. You actually need to use a much wider aperture than you might prefer, just to get every last little bit of light that you can. So this means using an aperture like f2.8, maybe even wider if you have the option, and you are going to sacrifice your depth of field when you use those apertures. You're not going to be able to get everything from the foreground to the distance to be sharp simultaneously. But what you will get is a photo that's bright enough, and that's the most important thing in these situations. So use a shutter speed of about 10 to 20 seconds and an aperture of about f2.8, and then your photo is still probably going to be a little bit too dark at base ISO, so you're going to need to use a higher ISO and then maybe brighten that picture in post-production even more. For a lot of my Milky Way photography, this means that I'm taking pictures at f2.8, ISO 3200 or 6400, and then about 20 seconds. And I've definitely gotten some photos that I'm happy with. And if I do want more image quality than that, in the past I've used star trackers or image averaging to get my image quality better than the typical photos taken at ISO 6400. And that does it for the four most important situations that you'll find as a landscape photographer. But before I wrap up this video, I'll just go through a few really quick settings that I haven't talked about that much so far. I will start with focusing. Focusing in landscape photography pretty much is easy in almost every situation, even when it's really dark. You can almost always use autofocus. If it is so dark that your camera won't autofocus, manually focusing is also really easy. Just magnify live view, spin the focusing ring until the image looks sharp, and then demagnify live view. The other setting that some people I'm sure are going to ask about is metering mode. I don't really consider metering mode to be all that important. Just go with whatever you're the most familiar with. I tend to use matrix metering because I like that it sort of examines the whole frame, uh, but some photographers prefer the consistency of center weighted or spot metering. In any case, the most important thing is just to make sure that there are no overexposed areas in your photo. Other than that, take the photo as bright as you can and you'll end up with better image quality, but the key is that nothing in your picture should be overexposed. That's why I made sure to mention earlier in the video that you should always have your histogram and blinkies enabled to avoid any possible overexposure. And then the final setting is your exposure compensation. Now, if you are using that aperture priority mode that I talked about a minute ago, 
Exposure compensation is the way that you signal to your camera whether it should be biasing your photos to be a little bit darker or a little bit brighter than the meter normally recommends. And again, just to protect those highlights, I tend to dial in about minus 0.3 on my exposure compensation, but again, it only really matters if you're in aperture priority. If you're in manual mode, you're setting all those things manually anyway, and your exposure compensation just doesn't have any effect. And that does it for the camera settings that I recommend for landscape photography. I hope that you found that useful. And to wrap up the video, I just want to say a big thank you. I know that I wasn't able to post as much as you guys wanted me to in 2021. I am going to be posting more frequent videos in 2022. But even so, even though I wasn't able to post as much in 2021, our subscriber count still increased. It actually increased when I wasn't posting just as fast as when I was. And we actually crossed over the 75,000 subscriber mark at the end of 2021. So a huge thank you for that. And in our next video, we are going to do something a little bit special to celebrate that 75,000 number. So if you're not already subscribed to the Photography Life YouTube channel, you might want to subscribe. And then you also might want to be one of the first few people to watch next week's video. I don't want to give away any spoilers, uh, but I would recommend that if you're not already subscribed. So I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions at all about camera settings for landscape photography, just let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer. I'm Spencer Cox, this is Photography Life, and I'll catch you next time.